two years old now. But this is the best that I've come across so far. It doesn't mean there's not more out there. It's just what I found. More than half of physicians have left the country because of targeting for kidnapping, ransom, and murders. 2,000 estimated murdered since the invasion. 250 kidnapped and estimated 164 nurses murdered. All of these numbers are up now. This is my favorite statistic. 243 million American tax dollars set aside by the U.S. administration to build 142 private health clinics in Iraq. The number of clinics actually built by April 2006, 20. The amount of money left, nothing. The amount of clinics opened, zero. 70% of child deaths continue to be caused by easily treatable conditions. 270,000 children, that's the estimate, of between the invasion and October 2006 have had no access to immunization. Health indicators for a society, 68% of Iraqis have no access to safe drinking water. Only 19% have access to proper sewerage and the sewage is running in the streets. Post-traumatic stress disorder, I alluded to it earlier with the picture, but this is really another lecture, probably a seminar. And when we hear about it in the United States, it's, to, it's in the context, and it's rare that we hear about it, but it's in the context of occupation soldiers who are now serving two or three or four tours of duty. The Pentagon says that one out of three soldiers will come home with post-traumatic stress disorder. I will tell you that three out of three soldiers come home with post-traumatic stress disorder. Nobody's coming home the same. I was in Iraq for three months with my family, and it took six months for me to recover, and I was not in a combat zone. When those soldiers come home, the strapped Veterans Administration health care system cannot take care of them. If you go in, and it's very difficult because they've been trained to be very macho and, and strong, and, and thank you, sir, may I have another... But if they cut to the point where they're going to go and say, you know what, I'm thinking about hurting myself, I want to kill myself, they'll get like, okay, we could probably get you an appointment in about two to six months. Okay, well, that's great. So in that time, if they don't kill themselves, what will happen is they will self-medicate. That's just the human response. That leads to alcohol abuse, drug abuse, domestic violence, then suicidality, homicidality, in the United States, we have homeless veterans on the street who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. 38% of the homeless in a country that, whose mantra is support the troops are veterans. That's the reality in the United States. So, so don't follow our example. <laughs> the VA healthcare system, as I mentioned, cannot handle it. And you're talking about a pool now for Iraq and Afghanistan alone of about 1.6 million. In Iraq, you have 26 million who are traumatized, and this is going to take decades or generations to overcome. The unbearable suffering of Iraqis, this was a report submitted by the Red Cross because of mass casualties, malnutrition, power and water shortages that have worsened, become more frequent since the Americans have showed up, noting that the plight of Iraqi civilians is a daily reminder of the fact that there has long been a failure to respect their lives and dignity. Also from this article, Sa'ad, a humanitarian worker, is quoted as recalling the scene after a bomb blast. I saw a four-year-old boy sitting beside his mother's body, which had been decapitated by the explosion. He was talking to her, asking her what had happened. This story is heartbreaking, but it is a metaphor for what has happened in Iraq. The United States and Great Britain invaded illegally. They devastated civil society. They brought chaos and violence, which is the, the comparison is the car bombing. They decapitated the leadership, executing the only established government. But when people say, it's so bad now, it'll get worse when we leave. Well, there's, that's counterintuitive because they were better off before we showed up. And when we leave, there's a few things I can guarantee you. Number one, no more bombing raids. It's only American and British planes in the sky. And in 2004, that was the number one cause of civilian morbidity and mortality because, as I said, it's women and children in their homes hiding from the violence in the street. Number two, it's the end of American-run prisons in Iraq. I have an article linked from my website, I think under the category occupation, of an interview of a guy who, who did time in Abu Ghraib under Saddam, did time in Abu Ghraib under the Americans. Uh, the Americans are worse. Now, we're all about winning in the United States, but this was not a contest we wanted to come out on top of. 
The International Red Cross Red Crescent estimates that between 70 and 90 percent of those Iraqi military-aged males who've been incarcerated have been arrested by mistake. Yeah, the, the military says, well, they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, they were in Iraq when the Americans invaded. And when we leave, there's no more rape and torture that continues. Even though the Abu Ghraib scandal came to light in 2004, nothing's changed to this day. I don't have time to go into it. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you want. But the same apparatus of death squads that the United States and its CIA established in the 1980s in Latin America has been set up in Iraq. It's not just the same, oh sorry, not just the same structure. It's the same people. From John Negroponte to Stephen Castile to ex-captain, army captain James Steele, it's the same people. In the 1980s, Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador were characterized by disappearances, torture, death squads, and blood in the streets and bodies turning up. Sound familiar? That's Iraq today. And it's the same people involved. So when the funding of that leaves, that's a good thing. Finally, it's the end of the murder, rape, and torture of Iraqis by Americans. And I guarantee you this. You bring the troops home from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they will stop dying there. And that is the only thing that will accomplish that mission. We have to stay and help. Now, I am not Iraqi. I have, sure, my dad's from Iraq, but I'm an American. But I feel comfortable in saying, on behalf of the Iraqi people, that they've had just about all the help they can take from the United States of America. For Iraqis, American help is economic sanctions that killed between 1.2 and 1.8 million. We, use, we are using na napalm, we are using white phosphorus, we are using depleted uranium. In the United States, we have technically less than 300 years of history, and that's not a democratic history, and that was really founded on the, the slaughter of the indigenous peoples. In Iraq, they have more than 7,000 years of civilization. Who needs whose help? And, and by the way, the Americans are not really the ones to be exporting democracy around the world, if you've seen our last few elections. Now, I ask these questions because there is an element of white man's burden in this driving, this need to stay and help. What if Iraqis were white? What if they were a 94% Christian country instead of a 94% Muslim country? What if they spoke Oxford English? Well, some of them do, but it didn't stop us. But the reality is, there is racism involved in that. The war on terror is a war of terror. It's genocide. And we are all responsible, of course, I'm usually speaking to American audiences, from the privates who carry out illegal orders, which they are obligated to refuse, to the chicken hawks who issue those illegal orders, to you and me, because unfortunately, that's what our governments have done. They've done all this in our name, and we're not helping in Iraq. I want to leave you with images of Iraqi unity that you will not find in the mainstream media because that's the reality that's on the ground. Iraqis see themselves as Iraqis first. Their religious, ethnic, sectarian differences come after that. This is it seems that the Americans didn't need to teach Iraqis how to demonstrate against illegal occupation. They figured it out. And I love this picture because this is the American tank and here's the foreign press. Now, <laughs> this picture is from a couple of years ago, and I thought, well, you know, probably it's so dangerous now, these, aren't, these demonstrations aren't happening anymore. These people are fighting for their lives. April 2007, this is public worker protests. Though it was illegal, Paul Bremer threw out the majority of the laws of the Ba'athist regime. One of the laws he kept was the law banning unions. And the Iraqis said, no way, we will seek to protect our resources. And here, the fastest construction project going on in Iraq is, the, is dividing Baghdad into ghettos, the same way the Nazis did in Warsaw, Poland. And what they're saying is, with our unity, we destroy all the walls of the occupation. So go ahead and good luck. We're not the first to invade Iraq, coveting its resources. We're probably not the last, but we're going to end up kicked out like everybody else. And here, they're demonstrating against the wall. Now, I can't tell you who's Sunni and who's Shia and who's Kurd in this picture, and it really doesn't seem to matter much to them and it certainly doesn't matter much to them. This is Iraq winning the Asia Cup. Such a huge victory for themselves and for the country to give hope to the people. Again, you can f look online, you can find out who's Sunni and Shia and Kurd, but it doesn't matter to them. This is a Western division and a Western construct. And these were Baghdadi sitting in a cafe witnessing the winning goal, 
and the government issued a curfew saying if you go out there will be violence in the streets, don't go out. And Iraqis were like, do you know when was the last time we had something to celebrate? We're going in the streets. And even in Karbala, they were celebrating this victory with a lot of pride to, out of the dreariness of their lives. So when you, they talk to you about sectarian strife, just remember there's a very proud people living there who will fight us to the, well, us Americans to the death for their dignity and their sovereignty. And that's basically, that's never going to go. You can't quench that out. So what do we do? Here's your take home list. Bring them home now, and you guys got to do some work on Afghanistan. Ban depleted uranium, ban cluster bombs, ban landmines, ban war. In the back of my mind, it's not a concrete project yet, but uh, with my medical background, I would like to go back and help uh, start reconstructing the uh, hospitals that, uh, that have been destroyed in my name uh, as, a, as a step towards apology and healing. Whatever you do, obviously I'm very passionate about what I do, um, and because it's very personal, but... I don't care what's important to you. Just stand up and speak out. Because if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And it's very important that you don't give up. Iraqis are not giving up. Most Americans are not giving up, those who are not profiting. I know Canadians are persisting for justice. I can see that by the turnout tonight. Together, we all persist for justice. And don't you dare give up until your mission is accomplished. Thank you all so much for your attention. It's been wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much.